All right, so in this short video, we're gonna show you how to actually do a sequential function chart, which is basically a step-by-step -step scenario. We're gonna show you how to control a simple scenario, which is a conveyor doing a box back and forth between photo eyes, right? Simply, as if, just as you see right here, a, what we're calling it is a simple conveyor system, right? Very easy to understand, but very knowledgeable about passing on information. Now, what we did, again, as you know, now this example is going to be sequential function chart. Now, we've also already done this in uh, structure text and ladder logic and in function block. So we actually saw that function block wasn't really practical when we did function block, right? As far as the logic to do this, you know, it was really complex when it came down to it. And the structure text was okay, very easy to read. Um, you know, it wasn't complex or what, whatever but very easy to read. And then ladder logic is the most, probably the most common thing going to be used. Now in this example, we're showing you a fun, um, sequential function chart because of the simple fact of there are benefits to using this, right? So dep depending upon what language you're trying to you know, program or understand or learn, um, when it comes into it, PLC programming, there's four languages, sequential function chart, function block, uh, structure text and ladder logic, right? Ladder logic being the most common used, but when it comes down to it, there are four languages. So we wanted to do a at least a, a good effort in showing you that, right? So when it comes down to it, um, this being said, this is the uh, can basically the sequential function chart. I'm going to explain step by step how this process works because it's very similar to a state machine uh, where you don't need to use latches and unlatches and unlike uh, uh, stuff like that for the bits when you're controlling them off and on. Uh, so let's look at step one right here. When you talk about this, we, we look at step underscore zero zero one. We have the conveyor forward tag, which is con controlling the conveyor forward, right? Uh, we have that set to one. And then the conveyor reverse, we're setting that to zero. Okay, so when we're doing that, we're, that's basically saying we don't need to use a latch because we're holding the bit true. We're holding the one bit true and one bit false, right? So we're actually telling it right then what to do, what mechanism to do, right? Either turn this bit on and turn this bit off. And we're not transitioning out of that state or out of that step necessarily until photo I one is made and photo I two is not made, right? So when it works, basically we're staying in this step, which controls the action um, underscore zero zero one and does the actions that we're telling it to do. In this case, it's convert, uh, conveyor forward one and conveyor reverse zero. Now in transition underscore zero zero one, we're waiting on photo I one to be made and photo I two not to be made. And then, then it will transition to step zero zero two. And in step zero zero two, we're gonna turn on uh, the conveyor reverse right here. And we're gonna turn off the conveyor forward. So in this instance, we're actually reversing what we've just, just did. So we're telling it to go the opposite way. All right, so when we turn a bit, we have to think about when we do a sequential function chart, if you turn a bit on, you need to turn it off somewhere else because again, it's going to stay in the last state that you actually controlled it in. So you need to actually, when, you, when you're when you thinking about a sequential function chart and programming whatever you're going to program within sequential function chart, think about it within the means of you're turning a bit on you're going to have to turn that bit off, right? Unless it's an input like we're using right here, which inputs are tr traditionally going to be used in your transitions and stuff of that nature. So uh, something that would either stop something from happening, which is a transition, right? Or allow it to happen, right? So you're, that exact uh, process of a transition is showing you to move forward or not to move forward, right? So again, it's like a gatekeeper. So if you think about it right here, transition 001 um, is going to be photo I1 and photo I2 not made. Uh, step, which is a step which you control, and simply we're controlling an action. We're telling your bits to go forward or reverse. And then, then uh, the transition 002, which is again, the, uh, acting like a gatekeeper, is saying, okay, photo I2 is made and photo I1 is not made. And then we're just looping back up here. Now at the very start, um, in the very start of the process, if we had a process upset, we're just saying both of these need to go zero. So we don't want to do anything. We want to make sure no photo is made and then we want to control everything. So if we had a process upset, if we restarted the system and we did a process upset, we, now this is a very easy scenario to do this on. 
it would pick up and continue on just like it did. So with all that said, I just want to show you another really simple example and a reason, you know, behind you know, controlling something like this with a sequential function chart. Um, now with a sequential function chart too, also talking about why you would do certain things and then why you would not do certain things, right? Uh, again, this is a very simple scenario. So we're basically telling a bit to come on and a bit to come off. And then we're, we're telling a bit to go on and telling a bit to go off. And then we're also waiting on the transition inputs that we're using to control it back and forth, right? So logically, this is a very simple and easy un to understand theory of operation, right? So what's important again is how the, the scope of work, right? You know, to make sure the, the machine does the, the task that it's supposed to do and then go ahead, make sure it's reliable, make sure it does that, that, that scope of work, it's safe, and then also, also make sure it's easy to read. I think this is, you know, if you look at the whole of this, it's pretty simple to read. So similar to what we did with ladder logic, uh, ladder logic was easy to read, easy to comprehend for the person behind you, right? Um, structure text was pretty easy to read, right? And then when we thought about the function block, it was really not that easy to comprehend, right? It's not really too easy for everybody to read. But when we come down to it, it was practical. It still, it served its goal. It hit its scope of work. So when we think about PLC program, we think about the things we do behind it. Is it easy to read? Is it, is it, does it achieve the scope of work, right? Then does it actually come in? Is it easy to read? And it, is it reliable, right? So th there's three or four factors when it comes to PLC programming that you really need to worry about. Uh, you can obviously dial it down to more factors as well, but three, at least a, three major factors, right? It, does it do the scope of work? Is it reliable? Meaning, is it rely? It, does it reliably do its task, right? And then is it easy to read? So I think in this aspect, this is pretty pretty much fits those uh, those goals right now is it optimal is it probably going to be more, one of the most common things you see probably not but when it comes to it does it achieve the goal yes it does so I just want to show you another case example of this simple example this simple conveyor with a box going back and forth and show you a reason why you would do another PLC language right or show you an example of that and hopefully you gained a lot out of this video and you learned a lot out of this video because again we talked about you know, turning bits on or turning bits off and while we're doing things and transitions and steps and stuff of that nature. So again, with all that said, we'll see you guys on the next one.